He is risen. He is risen indeed. Eh? Uh, you see, the, the problem comes in, though, is the world struggles with the idea of a God who suffers. We don't want a God who suffers. We, you know, Christianity is unique in that, and, and we understand a God who comes, dwells with us, and suffers. We struggle with that, and we, we try and have a theology that says that, no, no, that can't be true. And we lose any idea of suffering. And we say things like, oh, well, that must be because of uh, your sin or something like that. And we don't have a th good theology of suffering. The reality is, Christ died on the cross. Through his suffering, the suffering servant, you and I have life. And we, we see Paul kind of throwing down the gauntlet, you know, the, 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 uh, I love that phrase. It's, it comes from the old days of chivalry. You know, if you wanted to fight some other knight or somebody like that, you'd throw down the gauntlet in front of them and say, come, let's, ta let's take this outside. Let's go and sort this out in, in more modern language. But Paul in, in 1 Corinthians 15 really throws down the gauntlet ab about the resurrection, about the, the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. He doesn't give us a nice, easy way out. He doesn't give us a, 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 a sort of a plan B to sneak away from the suffering servant. 1 Corinthians 15. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preach to you, which you have received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Peter and to the Twelve. And after He had appeared to more than 500 of the brothers <coughs> at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep, then he appeared to James, then all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, uh, the one who is abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles. I do not even desire, deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I but the grace of God that was with me. As we read, I'm not going to read the whole passage, but, but go home and read this. Read the whole of 1 Corinthians 15. And I'm going to refer to some of the verses that are later on in the passage now. You see, because in verse 14, um, he, he, he says this, And if Christ has not been raised... Our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. You see, I'm throwing down the gauntlet. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, if Jesus didn't come back to life, all that we do as the church is empty, uh, what's that stuff called? Candy floss. You know, it's, it's nothing. It's of no value. You see, the apostles taught that they saw Jesus alive. And if they were lying, then what do we actually stand on? Paul throws the gauntlet down on this. He, he says, you know, these people saw him, these people saw him, these people saw him. And then he came to me. He's sharing from testimony, his own experience, that he came to me, the one abnormally born. You see... There was this kind of group of witnesses that said, yes, he was raised from the dead. Now, you might say, well, okay, they must have been a, a, a bunch of lies. You know, they, uh, 
That can't be true. Do you think if they were living a lie, when they went through persecution, because some of them were, you know, fed to the lions, others were hung upside down on a cross, some, you know, uh, the, 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 the Roman emperor's favorite uh, game was when he was having garden parties was to light a few Christians to burn in the garden, to light up the garden. Do you think if this was a lie, at that point they would have still stuck to their testimony? When they were being persecuted, when they were being murdered, they could have said, no, 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 and walked away. But you see, they had seen the risen God Christ. And it was burning in their hearts. And they stood by it. <coughs> Hence Paul's statement. He uh, appeared to me the least. In verse 15 and 16, we see him say, say this. More than that, we were then found, uh, more than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For you, we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. So, if the dead are not raised, then Christ wasn't raised. You see, he's, he's kind of approaching it from the other way around. We normally say, because Christ is raised, we will be raised. He is saying to us, the promise is that you and I will be raised from the dead. <coughs> that death no longer has its victory. Death no longer has its sting. In fact, at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, that's that, that famous verse. Death, where is your victory? He kind of looks death in the face. You know, remember, he's, he's under persecution. He says, death, what have you got on me? Absolutely nothing. I believe re eternal life has already started for me. Eternal life has already started for those of us that believe in Jesus Christ. Death has no victory. Death has no sting. Isn't that wonderful? He goes on in, 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 in verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. He's throwing this gauntlet down and saying, if this is not true, then all that you do is futile. You see, then there is no hope beyond this life. <coughs> There's the famous story of a, of a preacher during the Second World War. He was assigned to care for the, for the, for the guys on the front line who were atheists. And so he got them together and he said to them, Don't worry, I will not preach a Christian gospel uh, because most of you will die. The sermon will be very simple. Here lies Joe Bloggs, who was and is no more. Ouch. And as they say, in the trenches, there's very few unbelievers. Because as we face death, and this is what Paul is trying to say, each of us face death. Do we face it with hope? Or do we face it with that sense of despair? You see, he goes on in verse 18 and 19 saying that those who have perished have not perished. He's talking about the apostles. Have not perished, uh, uh, have not fallen asleep and perished and to, are to be pitied. But there's hope. There's hope. If Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead, there would be no hope. But I want to declare to each and every one of you, to declare to your hearts this morning, that there is hope. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. And because He is alive, I'm alive and you're alive. There's no half measures in this. 
He can't be just a good prophet, a good, a, a good philosopher. He either is alive or he is dead. That's the, that's the gauntlet that Paul has thrown down before us. What are we going to do with this Jesus? There's a story of, a, of three young kids. You know, three young boys, and as boys do, they you know, always get up to mischief. Not me, I was a saint. Um, <laughs> yeah. I suppose I shouldn't lie in church, hey? <laughs> um, but these three boys decided one day uh, to go into the church and will go one by one into the confessional and confess to outrageous sins. And they went one by one. And the third one tells the story. He said, I went in, and the priest was very gracious. He knew we were what we were doing. But he said to me, Okay, as your repentance for these sins you've declared, I want you to go to the front of the church to look up at the cross and look at Jesus on that cross and tell him that I don't care what you have done. But you've got to tell him three times. And that young lad went up there, looked up into the, uh, at the cross, and looked into the face of Jesus on that cross, and said, I don't care what you have done. The second time was, I, I, I don't. And then he just burst out into tears. And you see, that young lad that was sharing, when he shared it, was a bishop in the church. You see, he encountered, like Paul, the resurrected Christ. We can walk away from this place today and say, actually, I don't care what Jesus has done. Or, we can remember he's done it for me and he's done it for you. There's no half measures. Paul doesn't give us that option. You know, the greatest event in history and we get to celebrate it. One final story. I don't know if any of you know who Chuck Colson was. Uh, he was one of the, the, the people involved in, in the... Um, sorry? Watergate. The Watergate scandal. That's right. Ah, so, okay, you can tell the story. No. <laughs> but the Watergate scandal was when Nixon uh, had got you know, his tip, typical politician's corruption going. And he had a team of people break into the, the Democratic uh, National Convention building and what have you. And Chuck Colson wrote a book after he had been in prison for that. And he said, you know, the thing about the resurrection is the Watergate scandal tells me it's true. Because there were only 18 of us involved in that. And within three weeks, the story had leaked of what we had done. If the resurrection wasn't true, of the six or seven hundred people who were involved right at the beginning, guess what? It would have leaked very easily that this was false. It never leaked because it was true. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. And that's what we celebrate today. And we're going to celebrate today with baptisms, which are a symbol of us dying in Christ and being raised up to live a new identity and a new life. Amen? Amen.